lives making them. We, we make them every day, all day. We decide when to get up, what to wear, when to eat. We plan, we change our minds. We do this and we don't do that. But listen, there is an ultimate choice to be made, a choice that will inevitably seal every person's fate and destiny for all eternity. And this is it. This is the choice which the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of. This is the choice with which we are concerned with this morning. No decision is of more importance than this one. It is the ultimate choice. It is the reason why you are here. Deuteronomy 30.19 I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live. Joshua 24.15 Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Jeremiah 21.8 Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He stands at the crossroads of life and death and says, You choose. The contrast is stark. They are polar opposites. You cannot get any, get any more extreme than these right here. But it's not a contrast between those who have religion and those who don't. And it's not a contrast between the crowd that's very good and the crowd that's very bad. And it's not a contrast between the righteous and the evil. No, it's a contrast between a religion that saves and a religion that damns. It's a contrast between a religion of grace and a religion of works. It's a contrast between divine righteousness and human righteousness. It's, it's a contrast between mercy and merit. It's a contrast between divine accomplishment and human accomplishment. And ultimately it's a contrast between trusting in God and trusting in self. If you gather up all the religions of the world, if you gather up all the different belief systems, all the creeds, all the ways, all the forms of worship of all humanity down through history to the present, how many, how many religions do you think there would be? Hundreds? Maybe thousands? Well, if you uh, believe the wisdom of Wikipedia, there's about 4,200. But if you want to hear the wisdom of God, there's only two. There's God's way, and there's man's way. Man's way says, we have something worthy, something good, something special about us. You don't need to identify even with a religion. You just have to be a good person, you see. And many, many of these self-deceived people are professing Christians with their religion and works. And you can see that down in verse 22, can't you? Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles, and he will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice your lessons. And all and sundry will be lining up to present their Christian coupons. But they are all going to go up in a puff of smoke. Every person of every works-based religion will find out that their finest efforts are but filthy rags. Far from being many roads to heaven, it will be known that there is only one. And it's by the way of Christ, not man. It will be known one day. 
The Bible says there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. How many ways are there that lead to life? Well, what did Jesus say? I am the what? The way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He didn't say, I am a way, I am a truth, I am a life. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Look here, there's only one way through one person, it is Jesus Christ. He's the only choice he has choice of one. People will say, but, but isn't that exclusive? Isn't that restrictive? Isn't that very narrow? Well, yes it is. That's why it's called the narrow gate. What makes Christianity different from all other religions? What sets it apart? Why is it so exclusive, so restricted, so narrow? One word. Grace. God's grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Undeserved favour. Undeserved merit. It's got everything to do with God's grace and nothing to do with God, man's goodness. Now, to whom can grace be given? Only to those who come with nothing. It is for the unworthy, it is for the sinful, it is for the sick, it is for the poor, it is not for the worthy, it is not for the self-righteous, it is not for the healthy, it is not for the rich. You want to know something? Grace separates the entire human race. Those who would receive it, and those who wouldn't. The sheep are the ones who receive it. The goats reject it. Jesus demands every woman and every man make a decision about their eternal destiny. Because no one will accidentally end up in heaven. There is a narrow gate or the wide gate. God's righteousness or your own righteousness. God's work or your own work. God's goodness or your own goodness. There is no half and half. There is no mixing it together. It is all or nothing, take it or leave it. And tragically, most are on the road of human achievement thinking they are walking toward a secure eternity. The sign above the wide gate, don't be fooled, does not say hell this way. And that's not very appealing. <coughs> It says heaven straight ahead. It says the right way. It says the acceptable way. It says the good way. It says God's way. On this way you will find the very best of humanity. The great, the honourable, the decent, the good. And every single person of every workspace system is on this way. The religiosity of the Jews of Jesus' day represented the best that humanity could, could manufacture. You couldn't get any better. If anyone had the corner market on human holiness, it was them. They turned everything into a religious exercise and it was designed to bolster one's standing with God. On top of God's law, they heaped on up on their, uh, they heaped up their own laws uh, to show how godly they were. And they placed their whole confidence in this religious system. They thought their law abiding and re religiosity would get them home. Well, it did. It just wasn't the home they were expecting. Mm -hmm. They trusted in themselves and, and in their works, but all it did was damn them. How do I know? Romans 3. 
Romans 3 says the law came so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight. What's the law? Well, it's God's, God's moral law and written law. The law was never meant to show us that we can keep it. It was meant to, to show us that we can't keep it. It was given to show us how rotten we are, that we can't keep it, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Romans 3.20 The law, it doesn't commend us, it condemns us. The fact that God, God's law says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, over and over and over again uh, proves that there was a lot of shouting going on. We break God's law. We're wretched. We're in need of a Savior. Galatians 3.10 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. You say, but can't the good things, the good works I do, can't they make up for it? Well, no. For it is by grace and mercy. Through faith. That is, if you believe. And not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not as a result of works. So that no one may boast. Christianity stands alone. It is the only one that swims against the tide. It is the only one that stands out from the crowd. It is the only one that, that cuts through the darkness and shines like a great beacon of hope. Because it glories in Christ alone. All other ground, friends, is sinking sand. Mm. Two gates. Two gates. The first contrast is two gates. Verse 12 says, enter through the narrow gate. That's one. For the gate is wide. That's the second. And then in verse 13, uh, 14, sorry, it says, for the gate is small, we've gone back to the first gate. There are only two gates, but special attention is given to one. Why? Well, there's an imperative action required concerning it. What is it? You must enter the gates. You must enter the gates. Now, let me give you five some point, sub points sorry, concerning entering the narrow gate. First of all, it's not a request, it's not a suggestion, it's the command. The command. It's the command from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus doesn't beg people to come into the kingdom. He doesn't beg them to come through the gate. He's not sheepishly standing there saying, um, excuse me, I was wondering if you would like to... Uh... No. Christ demands. Christ commands. Christ orders. And he speaks with authority. Christ is authority. He can't be ignored. He's not making a suggestion. You must enter. It's, it's the only choice. It's the only way. It's the only response you can make. And the Greek meaning is of something that must be done and done with urgency. There is nothing more compelling, nothing more urgent, nothing of more importance than this. It is like the turning point in war. It is the war to end all wars. It is the D-Day of all D-Days. It is destiny day on the shores of eternity. It is decision day when you storm the beaches of life or death. And if you enter, it is a decisive strike for victory. Yes, the battles will rage on, but the war is won. VE day is announced, and the angels celebrate in the heavenlies. It is victory in eternity. 
It is life beyond your wildest dreams. Or it is death beyond your worst nightmares. You can't put it off. This moment determines every other moment. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ reveals a very narrow way. But because the Jews had added to God's laws man's laws, God's ways had been stifled and suffocated. All that was left was a man-made religion that tolerated sin and hypocrisy. And we see that today, professing Christianity, parading a bunch of man-made rules and regulations around. It's become little more than a clubhouse for the unconverted. Designed for the appeasement and tolerance of every whim and fancy. And Christ says, all that man-made stuff has to, be, has to be abandoned. We need to drop this. We need to get rid of that. All of it is useless and it gets narrower and narrower and narrower until all must be jettisoned. Christ slams hypocrisy and religiosity. He said, if you really want to get into the kingdom, then you've got to come this way, on these terms. There's only one way to get into the kingdom. This is it. There is no other. Access to heaven is through the gate of Christ alone. And, and what are the conditions of the entry? Well, we could back up to the beginning of chapter 5. They're all there. You must come poor in spirit, mournful and repentant over sin, abandoning your own righteousness, you hunger and thirst for God's righteousness with meek humility. This is the place where entrance into the kingdom begins. You have been given, you have to be given the righteousness that surpasses any righteousness you can conjure. You have to be given the righteousness of God, for without it no one will enter the kingdom of heaven. Two, the claim. How can Christ command such a thing? Well, this brings us to the second sub-point, the claim. First, the command, now the claim. Jesus makes certain claims. And if the claims are true, then the command is valid, isn't it? There are only two gates, two entrance points, two religions in the world, not thousands, and out of those two gates, only one of them is leading to heaven. Now that's a massive claim. Try preaching that at the next interfaith meeting. <laughs> out of the myriads of religions out there, only one of them saves. Only one of them is leading to spiritual enlightenment. The rest simply sweep everyone up who is on them to destruction. It's an audacious claim. You can't make a bigger statement than that. Acts 4.12 And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. John 10, 8, Jesus said, I am the door. The picture is of a door or a gate to a sheep pen, which was constructed of high, rock, solid walls to protect the sheep at night. Jesus is saying, salvation is found within my fold, but to get in it, you've got to come through me. <coughs> I'm the gate, I'm the door. I'm the way in. Then in verse 9 he says, If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. He will be saved. John 14, 6. I mentioned it before, I'll mention it again. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There is only one mediator between God and man. And if there is salvation in no one else, and if there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, 
and if there is only one mediator between God and man, and if there is, and if he is the door, and if he is the way, and if he is the truth, and if he is the life, and if no one comes to God except by going through him, the gate, then the claim is true. There are no alternatives. Everything else is a lie. If Buddha was God, was God or a God, then Buddha's way would be a way. If Allah was a God or, the, or a manifestation of the true God, then the Islamic way would be a way. If the Virgin Mary's and Joseph Smith's and Hare Krishna's and Baha'i's and Sikhism's ways were ways, then there would be many ways. But no, there's only one God and one way. Christianity is totally exclusive. It's the only way, and it's the only right way. And if it's the only right way, then everyone else is going the wrong way. This is why we must preach. This is why Christians are often called bigots, narrow-minded, intolerant, unloving. I tell you, there's nothing more loving than to warn a precious person that they're heading the wrong way. Man says, many roads lead up the mountain. Many roads lead up the mountain, but that couldn't be further from the truth. There are not many, there are not even two. There's only one. His name is Jesus Christ. Subpoint one, the command was to enter the gate issued by Christ in light of subpoint two, the claim he makes. But one cannot enter unless subpoint three one conforms to the conditions, the conditions. So there's the command, the claim, and now the conditions. What are the conditions? Well, look at the text. What does it say? Enter through the what gate? What kind of gate is it? Well, it's an arrogant. It's small, restricted, a tight squeeze. First, you enter with nobody else. You enter with nobody else. The gate is too narrow can't fit more than one. And at the zoo I remember as a child that the turnstile was very restrictive. <laughs> you kind of had to do the <coughs> shuffle walk as you went around. Uh, you couldn't even walk normally and there's the turnstiles at airports, at train stations and other places that admit only one at a time. And that's the best picture I can give you. You go through the gate alone you don't go through in groups. It won't be, oh, here comes the Wellsford group. <laughs> or here comes the delegation, delegation from Grace Community. We'll let them all in together. We know them. It's not husband and wife together. It's not parent and son together. It's not parent and daughter together. There's no two for the price of one. There's, there's no special deals, no group discounts, no family passes. No hitching a ride. Church affiliations, who you know and who you are connected to, don't give you one inch of room through that gate. You go through alone. It is a deeply personal, individual thing. When you get your ticket, it says, admit one. It's something that is quite, quite hard for us to stand, isn't it? Because much of our, our Christian experience is spent together. I mean, here we all are. Yet there are many who will tell you that getting into heaven is easy. And I'm talking about those in the circles of Christianity who peddle and believe in a false brand. No cost. Come as you are. Just as I am, <laughs> all you've got to do is believe, they say. Say a little prayer to Jesus and she'll be right. And once you've had that magic little ceremony or that magic little experience, you're one of the faithful. Entrance, guarantee. There's no cost, no repentance, no demands, they say. Listen. That is cheap two-dollar shop grace. 
Made in China Christianity. That's easy believism. That's heading down the wide way. If entering the narrow gate was easy, then everyone would be on it, wouldn't they? There would be many. But what does verse 14 say? For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life. And listen, look, there it is. There are few who find it. Very, very few. Second, you enter with difficulty. You enter with difficulty. You enter with nobody else and you enter with much difficulty. In Luke 13, 23, someone asked Jesus, Lord, are there just a few being saved? You see, many flocked to him, but, true would, uh, but few were truly following him. Many wanted a feed, but few were faithful. The masses still came to hear, but committed followers were becoming increasingly scarce. So someone asked Jesus, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. The implied answer was yes, just a few. Why just a few? Well, it says strive. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many seek to enter and are not able to. The word for strive is agonizomai, from which we get the word agony. Elsewhere in the New Testament, it's used in 1 Corinthians 9.25 of an athlete in agony to finish the race and win the prize. It's used in 1 Timothy 6.12 of fighting. It's used in Colossians 4.12 of hard labor. To ensure the gate is agonized, uh, to to enter the gate, it is agonizing. It's a fight. It's hard labor. To follow Christ, you've got to consider the cross. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else while, he is, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks the terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Listen, too many start to build and don't finish. The Christian landscape is strewn with half-finished, abandoned towers. You've got to invest everything. You've got to go unconditional. You've got, it's all or nothing. To build this house will cost you everything. To fight this battle, it will take all your strength. You will have to give up sinful habits. You will have to shed the pounds. You will have to wrestle with temptation. You will have to fight in the trenches. If you enter this gate, you will be like the man who found hidden treasure in the field. You sell all that you have and buy that field. If you enter this gate, you will be like the merchant who finds a pearl of great price. And you give up everything to purchase that pearl. Matthew 10, 34, 39. Matthew 10, 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than, mother or more, more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. As a Christian, you will face persecution. You will face ridicule. 
It will be war. There will be ostracizing. There will be hardship. There will be conflict. There will be testing. There will be discipline, growing pains, struggle, suffering, toil. The Bible says all hell's forces will be against you. Satan himself prowl, prowls around like a roaring lion, doesn't he? Looking to devour. Your fleshly appetites will be against you. False doctrines even will try and trap you. And false teachers will seek to lead you astray. Because the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. Everyone is forcing his way into the kingdom. Nobody just waltzes in. You don't just walk the aisle to soothing music. You don't just say a little prayer. It's not plain sailing. It's not a walk in the park. And it's not for the faint-hearted, the half-hearted, the insincere. It is a violent, turbulent upheaval. Women will know about this. It's called childbirth. New birth comes with pain, and it comes when you take it by force. Third, you enter with nothing. You enter with nothing. First, you enter with nobody else. Second, you enter with difficulty. And third, you enter with nothing. And you may have heard of the rich young ruler, Luke 18. He came right up to the gate. He was searching, he was seeking, he wants in. So he asks Christ, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? How do I enter? Christ tries the subtle approach. You want in? He said. Keep the commandments. The rich young ruler replies, I've kept them all. He may have kept the outward appearance of them. But Jesus simply, simply reveals the man's self-righteousness. So Christ reverts to the unsubtle approach. One thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor. You hit him right where it hurts. He's holding on to self-righteousness in one hand, and in the other hand he's clutching his possessions. Money. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad. For he was extremely rich. And Matthew adds that he went away grieving. You can't get through the gate unless you strip yourself of pride and privilege. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. And if you did, didn't enter like this, then you're on the wrong road. You've got baggage. You've got to drop the simple suitcase. You can't bring indulgences through the gate. You can't. You come through naked, smiting your breast, crying out to God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Bible says it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They can hardly get a piece of cotton through a needle. In other words, you can't bring baggage. The more you bring, the greater the impossibility. You've got to come poor as one who is bereft of anything. You've got to mourn over your wretched state. You've got to come meek, debased. You've got to come skinny and starving and all shriveled up, dying of thirst. And fourth, you enter into repentance. You enter into repentance. You enter with nobody else, you enter with difficulty, you enter with nothing, and you enter into repentance. One chapter on from the rich young ruler, you've got Luke 18, you've got Zacchaeus, Luke 19. Now, he also happens to be rich. But when Zacchaeus comes to the gate, he storms his way into the kingdom. Through repentance, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, a despicable man who extorted money from his own people by force. 
And that's how he became rich. Listen, listen to his response, Luke 19, 8 and 9. Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house. Salvation is impossible for the person who won't admit their sin and surrender it all. But it is quite possible for the person who will humble themselves and is willing to give up whatever it takes when he enters into the gate for repentance. Fifth, you enter a total surrender. Total surrender. Matthew 16, 24. Boy, he's really making a point here. Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow him. Follow me. He says, are you really wanting this way? Do you really want to go through this gate? Then join me in the death march. The cross. The ultimate symbol of death. Not only you have to deny self, you have to die to self. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. A person who truly gives everything up holds absolutely nothing back. Desperation and finding Christ is shown by dedication and following Christ. You don't take up the cross and then put it down. You drag that thing around everywhere you go. You pick it up. You run with it. You work with it. You rest with it. It goes everywhere in your life. Nothing is held back because everything is forsaken. And non-Christians think, we Christians are a bunch of pansies. We'll try the gospel on for science. Christ calls for total surrender. It's a call to the crucifixion. It's a commitment to death. Remember though, the burden is light. You're not sighing under its burden. You're not singing slave songs. You're singing under its blessedness. You're singing all to Jesus. I surrender. All to him I freely give. You're singing I will cherish. I will love the old rugged cross. Till my trophies at last I lay down. And I will cling the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. And you may still be thinking, this is a terrible deal. Who would possibly want this? And the answer is, you will. You will. If you're called by God. Nothing will stop you. The folk who are meant to come will come. That's why we must preach what Christ preached. What does Romans 8.35, we know it well, what does it say? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Verse 37. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. The more than conquerors. To those who will not enter, the oath of commitment that Christ calls for is it's far too much. But to those who enter Christ says, come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you, give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The road may start off tough for us, and narrow, but it just gets easier and better and greater and more glorious, glorious beyond imagination as we get to the end. The wide road, however, starts off very easy. It's wonderful. You can do what you want. It just gets very, very hard at the end. Don't walk away from the gate breathing like the rich young ruler. Be a Zacchaeus. Storm the gates of heaven. The righteous, what do they do? 
The righteous run into the name of the Lord and are safe. Two ways. Two gates. Now two ways. The second contrast is two ways. Two gates lead to two ways. There are two ways. There's a broad way of verse 13 and there's a narrow way of verse 14. Psalm 1 says the same thing. There's the way of the godly and the way of the wicked. There's the way of the blessed and the way of the cursed. What's the wide way like? When you come through the wide gate and you get onto the wide way, everyone's there. You can just hook up with your whole crew. There's this group, there's that group. Everyone's going to be there. There's room to walk the way you want to walk. To be who you want to be. To live the way you want to live. To believe what you want to believe. All the flavors under the sun are going to be there. The theology is diverse. Everyone's beliefs are valid. Compromise and tolerance reign. Just as long as you've got a religious feather in that hat of yours. You don't have to pursue biblical morality. You don't have to seek in a holiness. You don't have to take the Bible seriously. Jesus accepts everyone. That's the message. No one calls out sin. That's unloving. Don't get all judgmental. Just as long as you believe, because we're all going to heaven in the end, I'll go this way and you go that way and we'll all meet at the top. Mortification of the flesh and humility are confined to the pages of church history. The Bible is outmoded, truth is relative, and scriptural directives are reinterpreted for a new, sophisticated age, a morally advanced people such as ourselves. Old, narrow values, they say, they need to be broadened to encompass a more inclusive view. We can accept this thing, and we can accept that thing, and we can accept that lifestyle choice, because we are all glorious. We are all bringing a bit of good. We are all heading toward the light. Join the caravan of love. Jump on the easy train. That's what they say. That's the broad way. Proverbs talks about the broad way as being man's way. I mentioned it earlier. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Man's way is the way of death. Man's way is the broad way. There is no being poor in spirit, no humility, no brokenness over sin, no mourning over iniquity, no repentance, no meekness, no change required, no cost, no counting the cost, no transformation. There is only a deception of thinking that they're on the right way. Like the Titanic, the ship will go down, and no amount of religious deck sweeping and strategic placement of furniture is going to save it. Man's efforts at religious moral reform are like sprucing up an empty house, only to have evil and have a bunch of his mates move in and have a party. God isn't in the house. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Then there's the narrow way. It's restricted, precise, confined like a path cut into the rocky cliff face of a mountain. There's no allowance for deviation from the specified course. And if you do, whack! There's chastening from God. If you're wanting to venture down this way, then you better consider the cost. Jesus isn't interested in part-time followers. He's not calling for Sunday soldiers. He doesn't accept Christians with conditions. On the contrary, he turns them away. As he said to one such person, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. A second would-be disciple wanted to align himself with Jesus, and he said to him, you're not worthy of following me either. Yet another seeker came along with hidden conditions attached, and Christ said to him, you're not fit for the kingdom also. 
Jesus isn't welcoming the masses, he's turning them away. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He's saying, you've got to love me more than family, more than comfort, more than inheritance, if you want to follow me. This is the way you've got to come. This is the path you must follow. This is the way that you must walk. You might be thinking, isn't the Christian life meant to be a blessed life? Indeed. Do you know Psalm 1? If you think a believer's life is all doom and gloom and death, if you think it's all hardship and discipline, then listen to the opening Psalm, Psalm 1. How blessed. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree, firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. We've got all the blessings of God right here, right now, and we haven't even reached glory yet. Consider the contrast to the way of the wicked. Psalm 1 continues. The wicked are not so. But they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Two crowds. The third contrast is two crowds. There are only two crowds. There are two gates, two ways, and two crowds. And all the people in the world can be simplified down and categorized into two groups. There's not thousands of different people types. There's not hundreds, there's two, two crowds, the righteous and the wicked, the blessed and the cursed, the many and the few. That's it. The few, Matthew 22, 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. Luke 12, 32, do not be afraid, little flock. Then there's the many. Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter through the narrow door for many. Many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and, and shuts the door and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. We went to church. And you taught in our streets, and you will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from, depart from me, all you evil Do you know what's worse than knowing you're not going to heaven? It's thinking you are going to heaven, but in reality, you're not. It's being under the illusion that you're going to heaven. I can't think of anything worse. I would rather be an out of an out and out sinner. You can picture the fear on their faces and imagine the terror in their voices one day. And this is one of the most horrific, most haunting scenes, I believe, of Scripture. Christ says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's the meaning. If you think this gospel message is to non-religious folk, think again. It's not the non-religious, the out-and-out -out sinner, the rebel who just walks in off the street. It is to church folk, religious. 
The great majority of church people are under the delusion about where they are going to spend their eternity. Two destinations. This is where it's most uncomfortable. Two destinations. The fourth and final contrast. Two destinations. Two gates lead to two ways which are travelled by two crowds and they're heading to two different destinations. You either go through the narrow gate or the wide gate. You either go on the narrow way or the broad way. You either are one of the few or one of the many. And you're either going to heaven That's about as blunt as I can be. There is a broad way that leads to destruction and a narrow way which leads to life. And all the humanity is faced with with only two destinies. It's life or it's death. And every human that ever lived, every person that has ever been conceived is going ultimately to one of these two places. Listen, Jesus spoke more about hell than the prophets or the apostles. Jesus spoke more about hell than he spoke about love. Jesus warned men and women of hell more than all the writers of the Bible combined. Why? Why? Because hell is so hard for us to accept. It's a horrific thought that it had to come from God himself. Nothing is so utterly abhorrent to the human emotions than the thought of the place of hell. And let me just very briefly give you a few thoughts. First, Hell is a place of constant misery. In Matthew 8, 13 and 22, 13, Jesus describes it as outer darkness. What will people be seeing in hell? Nothing. That's misery. Sight and light would at least be something, right? You might be able to see someone. But no light will ever go on there will be nothing at the end of the tunnel. <coughs> nothing will ever be seen. No companion will ever come into view. Complete isolation and misery. Second, it's a place of pain. A place of pain. Do you know the parable of Lazarus and the rich man? The beggar Lazarus went to heaven while the rich man was sent to Hades. The rich man cried out, I am in agony in this way. He begged just for one drop of water to cool his tongue. Even his tongue was on fire. But he sees nothing. In Mark 9.43, Jesus says it's a place where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Pain, misery unimaginable. Your flesh forever eaten but never devoured, your body forever burning but never consumed. If there was hope of total consuming and annihilation, hope that an end would come, that would be something. But there's none. Third, hell will torment both body and soul. It will torment both body and soul. In Matthew 22, 13, Jesus said, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who was able to destroy soul and body in hell. One day every sinner will receive a new body, one that will undergo eternal destruction without ever being destroyed. And along with the burning body, they will receive a burning conscience, recalibrated, sinful memories to haunt and condemn. Memories of wickedness, of lost opportunity, of stubborn disbelief. And 
and I'm walking away from the gates. Fourth, hell will have, a ver have varying degrees of punishment. Varying degrees of punishment. Jesus said, and that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of the flogging will receive but few from everyone who has been given much. Much will be required, and to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. The Bible says, How much severer the punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? Those who willfully reject Christ will receive a more severe judgment than those who did not. Fifth, hell is incomprehensible incomprehensible. The Bible says that we don't even know the depth of the riches of God. And just as we don't know the depth of the riches of God, so it is that we don't know the depth of the wrath of God. We can't even scratch the surface know the depth. Romans 11.33 how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. The depth of the horrors and judgments are incomprehensible. They're past finding out in this life. Sixth, hell is everlasting. Everlasting. Matthew 25, 46, Jesus said, These, the ones there, will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous, into eternal life. It's not a place where sinners will continue in their pleasures. The party stops. Food and feasting are finished. The crowd disappears. The lights go down. The music is silent. And every good thing ceases forever. There will be infinite torment, endless terror, perpetual darkness, enduring hopelessness. The half crazed cravings of the countless, the howls of the haunted cries of the convicted will never cease. Time and eternity will not dull. It will intensify. With every tick of every second of that eternal timepiece. This one thought will continually dwell within me. That this, this is my portion. The grind goes on and on and on, and it will never, ever stop. One choice. So in the end, we're left with one choice. It's all we have. And without Christ, we are all dead. We are all in sin. We're all going the wrong way. We're all destined for that place. That leaves us only one choice. The only choice a sick man has is to seek a doctor. The only choice a lost person has is to call out for help. The only choice a poor man has is to beg. The only choice a criminal has is to grovel for mercy. There are no other options. And maybe you've already entered the narrow gate. Praise the Lord. Then, the, then walk the narrow way. Preach the narrow message, warn the many, persuade them concerning Jesus, enter into negotiations with people, people, about entering the narrow gate. Speak to men about God, about man, about the problem, about sin, about Christ, about judgment, about repentance, about faith. Romans. 
How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Get your beautiful feet on. For them to be saved, we must preach. Like an eternity. Maybe you're standing at the gate now. Maybe you're thinking about entering the gate. It's no good admiring the gate. It's no good standing next to the gate. It's no good waving goodbye to those who've gone through the gate. It's no use studying the gate. You've got to go through the gate. You need to exit the highway to hell and enter the lowland into heaven. You need to drop everything, repent of your sins and obey the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is your only hope. The Lord Jesus Christ is your only choice. The Bible says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you are without Christ today, you are heading to a dark place. If you are without Christ today, enter the gate. Are you sick? Then come running to him. He loves to receive sinners. Tell him how sick you are. Tell him how desperate you are. Tell him how disgusting, how disgraceful you are when everything is pure to me. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Enter the narrow gate, and he will wash away your sins. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be white like wool. He will clothe you with his perfect, perfect righteousness so that when God looks at you, all he sees is the perfect righteousness of the Son. It's as though you have lived the perfect life for Christ, and it's as if Christ died the death you should have deserved. Call on his name. Cry out to him. This is your life we are talking about. We are talking about eternity. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not leave this place until you have dropped to your knees and called, squeezed, shimmied you through the gate of eternal life. He is Christ. He will save you. Without him, you will be at your own peril. When you exit the broad way and into the narrow way, you will find life, grace, blessedness, joy, peace, hope, security. Death means nothing. Rest and a home in heaven forever. If you reject Jesus, you'll spend all eternity in the pit. Enter the narrow gate. Do it now. Make haste. Do not delay. It is life to you. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to there are many who are great. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Heavenly Father, a hard, tough, sobering message. Do with it what you 